Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 12th meeting in 2019. Could I ask all people present please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, so we'll move on to agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. The committee is asked to consider taking item four in private. This is to allow the committee to discuss the, its future work programme. Are members agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, we'll move on to agenda item two. This is an evidence from Ofcom on its annual plan, its Connected Nations 201 and Scotland report and other issues relating to superfast broadband and mobile phone connectivity in Scotland. I'd like to welcome the panel, particularly Glenn Preston, the director in Scotland, Jonathan Ruff, the Regulatory Affairs Manager, and Mansour Hanif, the Chief Technology Officer from Ofcom. Glenn, would you like to make a short opening uh, statement of no more than three minutes? If you don't want to, we can go right into questions. I'm, I'm happy to do the three minutes, if that's okay, convener. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity uh, to come and talk to the committee, as you said, about our annual plan and Connected Nations Scotland report. Um, I was about to introduce my colleagues, but you've done that for me, so thank you. Uh, I'll briefly highlight to the committee some important aspects from uh, both reports. Uh, the annual plan, the final version of the annual plan, was actually published last week, and we have circulated it to the, to the committee in advance. Uh, the Connected Nations report, which we published in December 18, shows that while there's been some significant improvements in recent years, we're still concerned that too many people in rural areas of Scotland experience slow broadband speeds and poor geographic mobile coverage. Uh, we do actually expect to publish an interim update to the data in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm very happy to share this latest data with the committee this morning. So 92% of premises in Scotland have superfast coverage, uh, and that's with 66% of rural areas covered, and there is some incremental, uh, incremental uh, increase on the rural side. And on mobile, 41% of Scotland's landmass has 4G geographic coverage from all four operators, but it is worth adding that this rises to 78% from at least one operator, which I know has been of interest to the committee in the past. The annual plan sets out our priorities for the next financial year. It follows a public consultation on a draft plan, which closed on the 8th of February. We had events around the UK, including in our Edinburgh office, where we had around 40 people in attendance from across the sectors that Ofcom regulates. Uh, the event was facilitated by the Ofcom board member for Scotland, who was able to provide direct feedback to the Ofcom board about how stakeholders in Scotland have told us that we should be delivering for citizens and consumers. It's worth saying in the annex to the plan, uh, it sets out how we've taken into account the written and oral representations, including from the Scottish Government, the likes of Citizens Advice Scotland, which academics, uh, and it covered things like opening up spectrum access and its allocation uh, and price differentiation for broadband packages, amongst other, other things. The final plan also takes into account our statutory duties, uh, developments in the markets that we regulate, and our own strategic priorities. The main themes are similar uh, to the ones that we discussed when we were in front of you February last year. So we still want to see better broadband and mobile services for all, and we are looking to protect consumers from harmful pricing practices. Uh, we're also continuing to innovate our approach to regulation to see better outcomes for people and businesses in Scotland and across the rest of the UK. Uh, we shared with the committee the publication of our access report, which we may touch on later today as well, which happened in the last few days. I'm also very pleased to report some significant progress following our last appearance before the committee. Uh, during that session, Mr Lyle, for example, raised concerns about the cost of calling directory inquiry services. On Monday of this week, we introduced new rules to protect callers by capping 118 prices, and that will significantly cut the cost of many calls, bringing them back to 2012 levels. Um, I do commend Mr Lyle's press release on this to other committee members if they haven't seen it yet. Um, and as of the 1st of April, broadband and landline customers will automatically get money back from their providers when they experience delayed repairs, installations or missed engineer appointments. Uh, and we've calculated the new scheme could see customers across the UK benefiting from around £142 million in payments. It's not disaggregated for Scotland, but we still think that number will be significant for Scotland. It's worth drawing the committee's attention also to our Boost Your Broadband campaign. It aims to help identify or help people identify the fixed broadband services available to them and get better value from their broadband deal. Despite superfast broadband being available to more than nine in 10 Scottish premises and momentum building behind full fibre broadband, our data shows people are often not on the fastest service in their area. 
We recognise there is a limited competition issue and therefore consumer choice in certain parts of Scotland, uh, but we are encouraging people to check what broadband they need, what's available in their area, and to speak to their provider or shop around where it's possible for them to do so to make sure they're on the best deal. Uh, the Connected Nations and Annual Plan reports are obviously the main focus of today's evidence session, but I know from previous sessions members will have a wide range of questions about connectivity, including in Scotland's rural and remote areas, and we're very happy to pick up any questions during the session. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Glenn, for that. And um, as Richard Lyle got the first mention, it looks like he's <laughs> getting the first question as well. So, yes, good, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Can I firstly thank you for... Um, Resolving a, a, a problem which I raised with you last year, as, a, as you said, off, Ofcom on Monday announced a price cap on 118, arising from a request that this committee and myself made to you last year. And um, basically, I think on behalf of consumers, I thank you. So, for my next request, <laughs> will Ofcom oh. assess the fairness of pricing differentials for consumers? And how will this be linked back to contract status and length of tenure? Thank you. Um, so, good morning, committee. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Lowe. So, uh, yeah, as we've said in our annual plan, we have just launched a review into uh, pricing practices in broadband services. So that will look in particular at, um, we'll have a particular focus on vulnerable consumers. Um, so we'll see, we'll have a look into um, the length of contracts that people are on, particularly um, people that have been on contracts for a long time and experience um, what's been called the loyalty penalty as well. So you'll be aware that that had been raised by Citizens Advice, um, lodged a super complaint with the CMA. Um, what we'll specifically be looking at though is uh, end of contract notifications. So this is both on fixed and on mobile services. Um, and that is designed to prompt people as they get to the end of their contract to shop around and look for the best deal that's available to them. Um, that, as I said, will cover both the fixed uh, and broadband services uh, and, sorry, and, and mobile as well, potentially. So the idea behind that is that competition um, is good for um, increased choice, lower prices and for innovation. Um, and so the idea there is that consumers, um, perhaps ones that have been less engaged with markets in the past, will then receive a sort of yearly, well, they, as they come to the end of their contract, sorry, um, a prompt to have a look around uh, for the best potential deal. So we, we would encourage people to approach their provider and uh, ask for, for a discount as they approach the end, because we'll find that that is a, one of the best ways of, of getting a reduction in, in your monthly fee. Yes, when, you, when you're paying over and, you're, and, and people need to shop around and people should be asking for a, you know, for a, you know, I, I don't hear people often nowadays asking for a discount, but they should do. And, and I encourage Ofcom, I know, now, and I know that you have teeth, and I know you're using those teeth in order to ensure that you're getting a fair crack for consumers. So uh, my next question would be, at present, what level of competition exists in the physical infrastructure market, and how concentrated in this in urban, uh, is this in urban settings? How often are Ofcom looking at incentive competition in rural locations, particularly in Scotland? So, so Ofcom's um, goal is to encourage uh, long-term significant investment in, in new networks. Uh, give consumers the choice to switch between those networks where, where obviously that's feasible, noting Glenn's comments around the limited uh, scope for competition in rural areas, and uh, to allow the companies making those investments to, to get a fair return. Um, what we will more likely see now is regulation varying by geography to take account of those different levels of competition. Uh, across Scotland that you mentioned. And that could be, well, it takes three forms, really. So the first um, form would be com competitive areas and the measures that we can put in place to support competing network build. So we want to see different uh, companies, different <coughs> providers uh, building competing networks. We recognise, though, in Scotland that that isn't always going to be the case. Um, and so we have to look potentially at different, um, how we would support different commercial models there. Um, in particular, the things that we'd be doing where there's less competition or less prospects for competition uh, is opening up open reach ducts and poles to allow other operators to get access to the existing infrastructure. 
Um, we would also um, be encouraging a well, we've allowed open reach, we're proposing, sorry, to allow open reach to recover the costs from rollout in uncompetitive areas by spreading the cost um, amongst consumers in a particular area. So that's similar to a regulated asset based model. And we've also, um, in terms of mobile competition, um, where there's less prospects for that, we have um, a consulted or proposing 74% coverage obligation uh, across our geographic landmass for Scotland. Um, so that's just a couple of the measures that we put in place there where there's less prospects for competition uh, in Scotland. But on the PIA point in particular, um, as you might have seen last week, we launched a proposal to look at how we'll conduct market assessments in future by a uh, geography. So I think that that's really important. That's something that we haven't done in the past. And I think that will bring benefits to consumers in Scotland where they might not have had a, been able to get the benefits from competition that you get in more densely populated parts of the UK. Um, can I, I, I'm going to bring Jamie in with a question and it may then bring you in, Mansoor, to, to, to help. Sorry, Jamie. Thank you, uh, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. It's just following on from actually the first, the first line of questioning around uh, consumer choice. Um, given that uh, many uh, packages, both broadband and mobile, are, are bundled together with other entertainment services these days, I wondered what, Ofcom, what work Ofcom is doing is uh, to make it easier for consumers to switch between providers in the same way that other industries have seen a marked shift. For example, the way that Ofgem has has, uh, has done a lot of work in, in ensuring that customers can easily switch between providers. Are we seeing a, a shift in the amount of people who are switching providers in the telco sector, or is it still quite stagnant uh, and people are, are finding it difficult to switch between one provider and another? Um, so, so I don't actually have, um, sorry, I don't have the data available at hand on the levels of switching, but perhaps you could provide that to, to the committee, um, follow up on that. But on your point around bundled services, um, Ofcom has, as you may be aware, we've got a broad, enhanced broadband speed code of practice. So within that, and I'm sure we'll touch on this later in the session, there's a provision there to allow customers to exit their contract without penalty if they're not getting the speeds that are being provided to them. Now, that's been enhanced recently to extend to cover all bundled services because obviously one of the, the main obstacles to switching would be if there's an issue just with your broadband but the other parts your service pay tv um, your landline telephone are unaffected so that's just one small change that we've made on broadband to could, could i just sorry, sorry could, I, could i pick you up on that sorry it, it, that that gets the nibble issue though if you're for example uh, with a provider who provides multiple services mm -hmm. and you're unhappy with one element of that service e i.e the television provision or the speed of your internet or the mobile aspect but you don't want to switch because you may you, you know be perceived as, as losing those other services how do you address that specific element of a package when you're in a, a contract which encompasses them all, uh, what, what protections are there to ensure that the whole contract is, is on par? So within each of the, so I've come, um, on pay TV obviously there's, we, we don't regulate that in, in the same way that we do with um, a fixed mobile and broadband services. Um, within that, there's obviously, and again, we'll probably touch on this as the session goes on, different protections we have in place for, for each of those different aspects of the package, but the, you would have to look at them as a combined package. The protections that you have for specific elements of it, particularly on broadband, uh, apply to, you know, to, the, to the whole package. So if there's a, an issue with your broadband, then you're able to exit your contract um, for, for that specific reason, I'm not sure what you would do if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're pay TV service, you were happy with that. If you're happy with other aspects of it, I guess you would have to weigh that up in terms of competition with the other offerings from from other providers. But there are specific protections for each element of your bundled package. There, there isn't anything as such that covers it as a as, as a whole. Mm. Stuart, you want to come in with a quick um, question? Just on the narrow question of switching. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if you split your packages across a number of suppliers, uh, one of the things that happens is you end up paying a line rental to each of the suppliers, despite the fact the number of physical lines going into your premise remains as one. Is that a proper way for companies to conduct themselves? Should it not only should it not simply be the prime contractor who's delivering the physical connection, who should be the only one making a line rental charge? So on, for, I'm not, I'm not sure if this will, if this is addressing your specific question, but on that point there around um, it being one line. So a lot of um, older people have just, for example, a, a fixed landline connection. Mm -hmm. And in the past, they had been effectively subsidising consumers who were taking a broadband and a landline package. So the, the, the price for just having a landline on its own wasn't much different to having broadband and a landline that disproportionately impacted some older consumers who didn't, for whatever reason, feel the need to have a broadband connection. So last year, we ha proposed um, a, a cap effectively on landline only services. So people aren't People who just had landline service, I think it was about uh, five, do, seven pounds. Do, do forgive me, I think what you're saying is interesting, but not addressing the point I'm trying to make at all. Uh, my personal experience, I had my broadband historically through TalkTalk, Talk, and I paid a line rental to them. But I had my voice connection via BT, and I paid a line rental to them. When I swapped from TalkTalk Talk broadband to BT broadband, I eliminated the line rental from TalkTalk. Talk. But given that BT were always providing the physical connection, was it proper and fair that TalkTalk Talk would... I, I'm not picking out TalkTalk Talk for any particular reason. <laughs> we're charging me a line rental. And I know from constituents mm. that that experience I've personally had was far from uh, being alone. So people are being driven to buying packages when they really may not wish to do so. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Mr Stevenson, that I've seen lots of evidence of people paying for the landline twice, effectively, is what you're saying. But uh, it'd, be, it'd be really helpful to pick this up in conversation afterwards if we could, because I'll, if it's we'll an issue, that, we're very happy to do that. Yeah. I think it might be helpful to pick that up, but it'd be also helpful to understand the problem. So once you've had a conversation, perhaps you, you could alert the committee if you feel there's, there's something yeah. that, that needs happy, to be addressed. To that, yeah. um, the next question is Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, one of your key action is, uh, actions is moving towards universal availability of high quality and secure communications network and designated universal service providers. Um, how will you determine who will be designated a universal service provider? Is it something that companies will be incentivised for or will it be linked to licensing? Thank you. So I, I guess that, that falls to me again. Um, so we, as you might be aware, we've been consulting on two potential universal service providers. So that's BT um, for, the UK, for the majority of the UK and KCOM in the whole region for historical reasons. KCOM is, is the, the, the main provider there. So we've already identified or proposing that BT will be the universal service provider. Um, we did have a consultation last year, which effectively was uh, opening it up to anyone that had an interest in becoming a universal service provider. Um, we didn't get the level of, of interest that we were expecting, and so we have the powers there to, to designate um, the universal service provider, um, and that takes into account BT's market power and obviously the, the, the reach of the network that, that they have and their um, historical position as the incumbent operator. Um, have there been any issues that the industry have um, highlighted to you as any barriers for um, designating universal service providers? So I, I guess part of the, the reason why companies might not have been interested in being a universal service provider is that there isn't a, it's cost neutral to them. So they, they are compensated for any costs that they incur in de deploying the network to, to areas where it might not always be economical. Um, but at the same time, they, are, they also aren't allowed effectively to make a profit out of that. So it's, it, there might not have been a commercial case there for, for, for other operators, or they might not see any benefit to them in doing that, apart from, um, I guess, maybe like the reputational 
uh, impact of being able to say they've delivered to, to these areas. But essentially, there isn't a commercial benefit to them in being the universal service provider. Um, and based on Ofcom's powers, um, we have an ability to designate somebody as the universal service provider if they meet certain criteria. And so in this case, in BT, they had significant market power. Um, and Sorry, just maybe you can answer this one as well. How does that affect competition then in the market if you have a universal service provider? So, so there isn't the, the universal service providers, the universal service is there because there's a lack of competition ah. in areas and because it's uneconomical to roll it out. So the, there isn't, um, it's, it seems more of a safety net, I guess, that isn't really there as the sort of driving competition. Uh, that, that, that's not really what, what it was about. It was providing a safety net for, coverage. yeah. Mansour, did you want to come This is for universal service broadband, which is the minimum service of 10 megs, which we feel is the absolute minimum that somebody should be getting. So it's quite a limited area. And we already have universal service for voice, which is, surprise, surprise, BT and KCOM. The big blocker is just having the reach and the scale to be credible and being able to deliver this everywhere in the country. And at the moment, unfortunately, that's, that's very limited. Stuart, do you want to? I just wanted a confirmation that KCOM is the previous monopoly supplier in Hull, yes. uh, who were therefore a parallel to the OBT. Yes. That's correct. That's what was all coming. Um, another key action you've got is aiming for universal mobile coverage. And you said in your opening statement, and I know that other people will pick up 4G, um, but we're still having massive problems in big areas, rural areas, to just getting a mobile signal at all. Um, so, aside from the plan statement on your spectrum-based solutions for your rural mobile coverage, what other technologies is Ofcom exploring? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. So we, Sorry, we can I just clarify? Don't worry about the button. The gentleman on your left will okay, push it for you. Say, it will light up automatically. Say, I think he'd lit it up and you'd turned yourself off. So, <laughs> but you're very much on now and, and okay. lead away. Hello. Yeah. So, no, it's a great question, and uh, this is really hard to solve, and uh, many people, including myself in my old roles in bt &E, we've been trying really hard to push out more coverage. Now, the reality is it is improving, but clearly not fast enough, and demands are increasing. So we do, I think, as a country, you know, we share the government's ambitions to have universal mobile coverage as well, and the government has set a target of 95% uh, geographical coverage, which is a revolution in the way we measure coverage because before we would only target coverage to where people actually live to houses. So it's a really it's a really big challenge. So we really believe it's a stepped approach where the first thing is to use the spectrum auction that we have currently ongoing as a first step to get as far as we can. And we've set what we believe are reasonable targets that people can reach, uh, several operators, so two coverage obligations, because the main thing is we need to have choice as well. It's no good just having one operator. You need to have more than one. So we think we can get to a certain amount of the distance there, and we'll see where we land with that. That includes an obligation to build at least 500 masts each. We're hoping you know, quite a few of them will be in Scotland where they're needed you know, very much, and also covering partial knot spots where you don't have good indoor coverage. So that'll get us a certain amount of the way there. Uh, I think we're very clear that we're not going to get to the 95%. So the next thing we would do is seeing where the gap is between that and the full coverage, because 95% geographical is pretty much, you know, it's equivalent everywhere. A lot of those areas are national parks, like Cairngorms. A lot of those are mountains. Uh, I just flew over them yesterday, and I was looking at what a challenge that is. But it can be cracked, but only through innovation. So just to give you an example of two or three technologies where we could look at, one is, one is there's, um, <clears throat> there's new technologies in 5G which allow for what we call beam forming. So that's using higher frequency spectrum, smaller antennas, but putting more of them in together on a single box. What that means is you can target coverage in a much more precise way. What that means is that we could trial this out on the existing broadcast towers, because in Scotland you've got lots of thousand feet towers for broadcast. Now operators today only install at 30 meters on those towers, they do use them but they only put them at 30 meters on average because the existing, the old technology meant that you need to choose the right antenna type and above 30 meters it gets really hard. The new, the new system allows it to be flexible so for every single user you can target the coverage and that's something totally revolutionary and we're, we're pushing the government to trial that out 
later this year, especially in Scotland, where we could put it on the existing broadcast towers and see can we actually get much more efficiency. That's one technology. The other is there is a revolution going on in satellite, low Earth orbit satellite technologies. Uh, there's at least two global consortia who are rolling out in the next few years. We did have a look at this for the USO obligation, but they weren't mature enough uh, at the time. We think in the next two to three years they will be mature enough to some extent. Whether they fly over Scotland or not is something that we'll need to keep a close eye on. We hope they will. Um, but that would allow a direct from the... These are at 500 kilometers rather than the tens of thousands of kilometers that the existing satellites are, which means they can connect directly to mobile devices. So the third area is device-to-device -device technology. This is used today in the emergency services where the police can, if they're out of coverage, they can hop from one phone to another phone and back to the network. So we think there's scope to do this in places like the national parks because the biggest issue in the national parks is that I don't think anybody really wants to build thousands of ugly towers in the national parks. That's, that is the challenge if we really want to get to universal coverage. So if there's smarter ways of achieving that through innovation, then it's something we should be looking at. The other final thing is communities, because the biggest issue um, with actually getting a model that gives return on investment is the cost of running that infrastructure. And we think that if there are communities out there, especially in Scotland, who think that they have they have a solution that they can use to lower the cost of running those networks and, and meeting a, a certain level of reliability, then, then there's a lot of appetite from the operators to actually speak to them. And we're proposing that we can facilitate those discussions today to try and get something that works for everybody. Um, Maureen, you want to come in? Yes, I wonder where you are um, with uh, national roaming. I think it was alluded to in the recent 700 megahertz consultation. I mean, you say that it's, your work is not about raising money, but, you know, why can't you open up the spectrum to anybody and everybody, accept lower receipts, um, and therefore allow for higher coverage? I'm happy to, to answer that. I mean, the issue is, I mean, when you look at the, the Connected Nations update that we got, we're currently reporting on where you have all four operators which is the worst case scenario. And as I said, we want to ha have the, the situation where you have choice, so more than one, but you don't necessarily need all four. Now with the case, oops, excuse me. Cover it, we have coverage. Yeah. <laughs> I'll switch it off. So the, uh, sorry, can you switch that off? Thanks. Sorry about that. So the, um, so what we don't want to do is discourage investment. And it's the same thing with fiber. So if you look at the all four operators, you've got, in particular, this is a competitive environment. You've got one operator who's pushing out you know, across the country and is slightly <coughs> ahead. You've got two other operators who are not that far behind. And you've got one operator who simply has no interest in the rural areas. So if you put in an obligation for mobile roaming, you're disincentivizing people to actually build the networks. It's very similar to the, to the case that we mentioned on fiber, where we, we need to get a balance where there's incentivization to actually build the networks, and where that can't work, then we should be open to forms of sharing or roaming, et cetera. So specifically on the roaming point, we've, we've already had a look at this several times, and we feel that ob an obligation on roaming would disincentivize investment in the rural areas, of, in places like Scotland in particular. So we think an obligation is in the right way. We haven't excluded, so we haven't excluded in the future, depending if the coverage obligations that we're putting in and the other levers on, invest, on innovation, if they don't deliver you know, in the medium term, it's something we can always come back on. But we think rather than that, the voluntary roaming is something that should be very much more uh, in vogue today. Because as I mentioned before, it's not just roaming between operators, but roaming between the operators and local community networks, such as the fixed wireless networks that are run in many places in Scotland, or radio, community radio networks, or community IoT networks. We like to allow a better roaming there on a voluntary basis, because we think it's in the interest of the operators and the local communities. So we think it's much better to look at those models now than actually providing an obligation which would actually disincentivize people to actually invest. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mansoor, you said about the emergency services network. Um, the the contract was given to EE for that quite a while ago, but I know that there are masts that have been put up that are still not live. Do you know when the whole system's due to go live? 
Yeah, well, the, uh, we're very close to that. It was it was one of my one of my projects when I was in E. But uh, so there's there's mass going up every day. So uh, these things sometimes it takes a long time to do the groundwork, and then you remove the blocker and they'll come up. So the program it's a very complex one, and I, I, won't, I can't go into all the detail. It's obviously managed by the Home Office, but they are putting up masts around Scotland every single day. I would make the distinction that well, it's the, it's the biggest mast build that we've had in the last 15 years. A lot of the areas around the Highlands and Islands where there was a lack of road coverage in particular. I know road coverage is a sensitive item, but thanks to this scheme, a lot of the roads are being covered because the main targets for emergency services are the roads. I would make a distinction that there are some towers, there's about there's several hundred towers that EE is building as part of that, but there's a, the, the most remote areas are a separate contract that the Home Office is building themselves, and those are the ones that have been slightly delayed, but they're also coming on air. So when we looked at the coverage obligation, we looked at the current status, and whatever we felt was credible evidence of progress, we took it into account. But where it was still uncertain, we couldn't take into account. As we've got now the consultation responses back, we'll have another look and see what is the real progress. But I think the reassuring, even though the overall program launch has been delayed, it's about two-year delay, I think, and it's a staggered transition over three to four years, and unfortunately Scotland was towards the end of that transition. That's the overall program for emergency services because it's also linked to the core network that they're building as well. But in the meantime, the physical masts are coming on air all the time, so there should be benefits. So if you look at just the last four months, we mentioned that there was three was a three percent geographical increase in just the last four months. That's about two and a half thousand square kilometers in the last four months in Scotland alone. So things are moving ahead. It takes a bit of time before you actually feel it though in, in your in your phones. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from me and, and it and re, uh, relates to protecting consumers from harm. Um, there's a TBEST scheme which is in relation to assessing how businesses are capable of countering uh, and penetration to their systems. Um, you were to roll that out in early 2019, so could you just give the committee an update on how that's going, please? Yeah, very happy to. That's, that's being run through my team. And it is something very new for us. So the TBEST scheme, for those who aren't aware, it was, it was modelled on the CBEST scheme, which was run by the FCA in the banking sector and finance sector. It was extremely successful. And it's based around threat-based you know, threat intelligence penetration testing, preventive of those banks. And uh, it, over the last three or four years, it was very effective. So the government decided to spread that across other sectors, and uh, T-BEST is the telecoms scheme for the T, and uh, they've asked us to take that scheme over. So last year, they ran two pilots. One, that was DCMS running that pilot, the government. One was with a fixed operator, and one was with a mobile operator. So we, we participated in that, but we weren't leading it. We took the learnings, and we've adapted it to our duties and obligations that we have currently under Section 105 on security and resilience, and we've adapted that scheme to the telecom sector. And in January, we took over that scheme. And at the moment, we are um, planning to apply that to all the large uh, operators, mobile and fixed. And we have a scheme that's going to be kicking off now from March to April. So the current status for the telecoms operators is that they've all received a very detailed questionnaire to allow us to build a a visibility of their approach to security and resilience. So that's ongoing now. We should have the responses within a few weeks. And we've actually had several of the large operators volunteering to go first in terms of the penetration testing because they take this, you know, they do take it very seriously. It's a difficult problem to solve 100%. So we have a list of operators who will be, will be starting the penetration testing sometime in the summer. And it's going to run for about three to four months. So it's a voluntary scheme, I should make that out, which means they will be paying for that testing, which is a testament to the fact the fact that they're volunteering means they see real value in that. And I think it's a very positive thing because, you know, uh, uh, it's really important that security and resilience is taken seriously by everybody. So that's moving ahead. So is, is there some way consumers can know whether companies have been through, through this? I mean, is there a... a, a a symbol or something that they can see automatically that, that, that this has been tested? Because, I mean, it would give consumers confidence. That's a very good question. Um, I don't think we've completely concluded on... Well, we certainly haven't discussed having a badge or a certification. What I, I think it's a good idea that we look at, 
we will certainly be communicating further to the public and, and to government on where we are on the scheme. Mm -hmm. The one thing we'd be sensitive about is not giving the impression that because you've been through the scheme, yeah. you're immune. So that's there where I'd be very sensitive because the reality of security threats are that they're continual and there will never be a 100% guarantee. So that's the only thing I'd be sensitive about. Okay. Um, Glenn, you, you certainly made uh, Richard's day on, on caffing um, uh, call <laughs> charges uh, and, and I'm uh, not ashamed to say the, 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 that again because I think it's good work as a result of the committee. But one of the things I pushed you for last year was on nuisance calls mm. and the whole issue of nuisance calls. I don't believe that I've seen a drop-off in nuisance calls. I, I still don't see any drop-off in nuisance calls who you can't trace. And I still don't see any drop-off in nuisance contacts from companies who you've told them once, you've told them ten times, that you don't want their continued um, solicitations for businesses, whether it be for smart meters, which seems to be the one at the moment, or anything else. So is there any way you can tell us what you're doing on that and whether you're going to address it and make my day next year by coming back <laughs> saying that you've solved it? Glenn. Or Jonathan. But yeah, but perhaps I could take that one, convener. Thank you. Um, so nuisance calls remains a very important priority area for us. Um, we play an active role with the Information Commissioner's Office, so you may be aware it's not just Ofcom's responsibility to, to tackle this, this problem. Um, your point there around a, a reduction in nuisance calls, there, there's actually been a 30% year-on-year decrease since 2015 of nuisance calls. So apologies if you're not feeling that personally, um, but I think we, there's information that we have to suggest that around like 500 million calls have actually been blocked um, since then. So there's, there's obviously a, a lot of technical challenges behind that around how we block calls, uh, number spoofing. Um, since the 1st of October 2018, we've actually had the powers to remove phone numbers from people as well. So I think that's a, a worthwhile addition to our sort of toolkit for, for, for tackling this. Um, but although it's not explicitly uh, mentioned in the plan, we don't go into a lot of detail um, on nuisance calls and that it is picked up through our, our ongoing uh, sort of enforcement work um, and it, we, we do sort of refer to, to that as ongoing enforcement across the whole range of Ofcom's work but it's to reassure you that although it's not specifically in the plan it, it remains a priority area and there has been um, a, a year on year reduction uh, as I said. Because as people move more from traditional telephony to IP based internet services it gets harder and harder because it's easier to spoof numbers. So we've also announced some work we're doing uh, on blockchain, which can allow us to actually better manage where numbers are allocated in the IP space. And we put a lot of focus on the first thing we want to do with that is to help us stop nuisance calls, which are coming from IP spoofing as well. OK, well, hopefully next year I will see the decrease. Not seen it yet. Stuart. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Camina. I want to uh, address uh, the issue of geographic coverage. You've just given us some updated numbers, which, if I wrote them down correctly, 41% of our landmass is 4G and 78% at least one 4G. Um, I'm not impressed by the latter figure because it means I would have to have multiple handsets, depending where I was, if I was to be able to exploit that. You know, having and I, I speak personally as someone who at home has precisely 0G, not 2G, not 3G, not 4G, uh, outside the house, far less inside the house. Um, so isn't it absolutely perverse that we're seeing the target for coverage being reduced at the present, when in fact we should be seeing it increased? Okay, sorry, can I, can I just check, Mr Stevenson, what, which target is, is being reduced? Well, I, th I think uh, what, 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 the Ofcom have reduced the target for geographic coverage in Scotland. So the 74% the figure? Correct. Yes. And, okay. and, you know, I just have to say to you, that is utterly perverse. Um, I mean, I would say that we should have no improvements in telephony services in cities of any kind, including 5G, until we get decent rural coverage. Now, I'm an extremist on that, but I'm not alone in that. 
Um, so why are Ofcom reducing the target precisely at a point where we should be seeing renewed and additional effort in rural areas for coverage? So, no, I, I don't think you're alone on that. I think everyone around here would agree that, that more needs to be done to, to improve rural coverage. The 74% target that we've pre proposed for Scotland, I think it's worth really reinforcing the point that this is the largest increase out of any of the UK nations. So, Scotland is coming from a much lower starting point. I think the average 4G coverage is around 50% of, of land mass. That's a huge increase take the point it's, it still lags behind the rest of the UK but I guess these things have got to be done in, in, in steps so that's the largest increase out of any of the UK nations the vast as Mansour touched on it earlier about the value of, of the spectrum um, the vast majority of the value of the spectrum auction is going to, to Scotland um, so I think that that's a really important point to make firstly um, the reason why the coverage target for Scotland does uh, in comparison to the rest of the UK nations, it is lower, is because we have to weigh up the costs um, for the operators in deploying this and, and the benefits. And there is a real risk that if we don't get the balance right on, on setting that coverage target, there's a real risk that the spectrum um, obligation would go unsold. Now, that would be a big problem for everyone across the UK as well. So there's a balance there for Ofcom, and we've got a duty to ensure the optimal use of spectrum. So there's a tension there between balancing the costs of, of de deploying networks in these areas. And I think Mansour touched on it as, as well. For Scotland to get up to the equivalent of the target for the UK, there would need to be somewhere in the region about an extra 500 masts that are built just to get up to that target that, that's for, for the rest of the UK. And there is no escaping the fact, obviously, that in these areas, the commercial case for, for deploying is, is, is not as strong. And that's partly because, obviously, the challenging terrain and the fact that it's just simply less, less densely populated as in other areas. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be trying to achieve as wide geographic coverage as possible. And so, as I said, it's the largest increase out of any of the UK nations. Y but I do to your point. Yes, but if we had the roaming, the 41% would automatically go to 78%. So you could get a 37% uh, uplift. Now, Mansour said com commercially you can't do it. And that is utter nonsense. And I'll give you an example of why it's nonsense. When banks started to join their ATM networks together, one of the things they did, recognising that banks with wee networks would get a huge benefit in getting access to the big network, there's an interchange fee. In other words, if a customer of Bank A uses an ATM at Bank B, Bank B gets paid by Bank A. So therefore, and by the way, what happened over about 10 years was the small networks grew so that you got more or less balance of the amount of money that went between the banks. If you did the same in networking, in telephony, where a tiny mobile operator had to pay but had a legal obligation. So I just don't view, I think we're viewing this as a technology problem and it is also a business problem. And I just don't accept what I heard about the arguments against network roaming. And as I say, the incentive in Scotland is immense. You could get it from 41% to 78% on my phone on whatever network operator I was using simply by changing the business rules. I also want to hear about the, the, the unused but licensed spectrum. Okay. I, I know I spoke to Nominate and I know they have views on this and I've responded. Yeah, can, Sorry, can, I'm having can, a rant. Can, uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, well, I, I wasn't going to suggest that, but could we let Mansour perhaps... Uh, answer the first part of that question um, uh, about... So maybe, yeah, so I take your point. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. I'm not saying that it's that there isn't commercial solutions to the type that you mentioned. Now, the problem is they cost, uh, the overheads of those in the telecoms field are so big that uh, they need to, the scale that's shown in those areas is, is not that relevant. But that's not the main point I was saying. The main point I was saying is there is one operator in the UK who said, you know, national roaming is a great idea. Why don't we do it? That operator is the one that's dragging their feet and is, is causing everybody to be at 40% or 50% because they couldn't care less on rural. So if you allow national roaming, so they know full well that the actual compensation, if you apply an obligation 
where the operator has put in you know, hundreds of millions of pounds to lead on the rural side because they believe it's something that needs to be done for their strategy, and the other two who are not far behind. So if you just compensate them with an obligation where they will never recover their costs, then you're getting a result which is not good for Scotland because basically uh, uh, the, the operators not investing will get an easy ride. So when we say that we think that roaming could be a good solution provided it's based on a voluntary, it means what is the right commercial deal that actually can compensate and still incentivize mm -hmm. companies to invest in Scotland and still get that. Because that's where we are. And I think there are new technologies coming out that can do that. And it also, so that's where I was saying basically there's one company that's dragging their feet. They're happy to do national roaming because they don't want to invest. Uh, if there is a way that the companies that are investing can be suitably compensated for doing it, for, do, for allowing the other ones to roam, then that's something we should absolutely encourage, and we will encourage if there's a, a voluntary scheme that can do that. The other point is very linked to that, which is the spectrum, sharing the use of spectrum that's not out there. There's a fallacy that it's spectrum that's the issue, but the reality is in the area where you, where, where you have, unfortunately, you have no coverage, um, there's nobody using the spectrum there because there's no coverage. Correct. So national roaming wouldn't help you anyway because there's no, no, nobody there to roam on. But nobody's using the spectrum either. So the reality is if you were to, to get together with your friends and build your own network, or build, you might be doing a fixed wireless network, you might be doing a local community network, and if you can show that you can actually, you have local resources and teams who can help to actually lower the cost of monitoring and providing a quality of service, I'm 100% sure, 100% sure that at least one, maybe two, maybe all the operators would say, we have no issue in letting you use our spectrum, and we will put in place that scheme that you mentioned in the banks to allow our customers to roam back and forth. Because but, that's sorry, the, that's do the only forgive block. me. Are you saying, therefore, the commercial operators have the veto of, a, of a communities being able to do that in areas where there's white space on the ground? No. If you want to use TV white space or any other spectrum that's not their licensed spectrum, you can do that. Today, up till now, there has been no agreement where an operator... I mean, because people have been just saying, give us, give us the operator's spectrum um, and we'll do it ourselves, that's not a way of getting, an, an, a, a, you know, without any kind of agreement on roaming, it's not going to get very far. What we see now is the operators understand that they're not, they're not offering the right service to people like you as they should do. They get that now. We've made that a big headache for them, and I used to have that headache when I was working for the operators. That's understood now. The problem is, how do you get a point where it becomes constructed to everybody? Now, I've been approached by many fixed wireless operators who are small family companies sometimes, uh, community radio companies, community IoT companies, many in Scotland, the Smart Rule, for example, in Scotland, who are really good at what they do. And what I've asked them is, can you actually get the operating cost down to a reasonable level, um, which is attractive? And if you can do it better than the operators, we will be, Ofcom, we will be the facilitator, and we will make sure the operators understand the opportunity, and then they're, they are ready to give their spectrum, whatever spectrum is needed, to those operators, and then put in place the necessary roaming agreements. And if they do that, what we will do is we will take that percentage of coverage off their coverage obligations, because that's a win-win for everybody. So that's something that we think has got a lot of legs now, but it's, a, it's about everybody putting their, their best resource together. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next question, which is Colin. Thank you, Convener. Um, I suppose sticking with the subject of um, inferior services in, in rural area, but can I, can I turn to, to broadband? In, in your opening comments, you updated the committee that, that superfast broadband coverage in Scotland was 92%, but in rural Scotland it was just 66%, and that compares to the rest of the UK, but in, in rural areas it's 74%. Do you accept there is a, a, a real digital divide um, and that rural areas are, are quite frankly being discriminated against? Uh, and when do you estimate that all premises in Scotland will have access to decent broadband? Um, so th th thank you for the question. Um, yes, I think everybody um, around the table, and we acknowledge that in the, the Connected Nations Scotland report as well, that there has in the past, there, well, there still is a digital divide between urban and rural areas. Um, that gap is closing. We've seen some significant improvements in, in coverage across Scotland. There's, in terms of your question about when will we see, see improvements, there's a number of things I would point to that are it's happening just now. So firstly, there's the um, Ofcom's implementing the UK government's universal service obligation, 
we expect from uh, late 2019, early 2020, people will be able to request um, a, the universal service obligation. As Mansour said, that was 10 megabits per second download speed with 1 megabit per second upload speed. So that, that is the minimum that Ofcom um, considers that people need to be able to do the full range of activities such as streaming, uh, online shopping, um, gaming online as well. Um, in parallel to that, in parallel to us progressing our USO responsibilities, obviously the Scottish Government has its own Reaching 100% programme as well. The aim there is to bring 100% um, uh, sorry, 30 megabits per second speeds to 100% of premises. Um, so there's two immediate programmes that are happening there that we'd expect to see improvements in, in rural areas. And um, as Mr Lyle touched on uh, earlier, we just last week um, set out proposals for, as I said, for looking at how we assess competition and therefore the remedies we put in place based on geography. Um, so there's a recognition, I think there's, there's competitive areas. Um, a large number of, a large part of Scotland won't fall into that category. There's areas where we might have to support alternative models such as single or shared networks. Um, and there's a third category of areas where there just simply isn't any commercial case for, for people to roll out broadband. And th there's no prospects for that happening anytime soon. So what we're doing there is supporting public policy makers um, and helping them um, I guess providing technical regulatory advice on the programmes that, that they would that they are looking to roll out, but I guess there, there, there does come a point where you reach, reach the limits of what regulation can do, and then there's a case for public uh, intervention, whether that be from the UK government or, or the Scottish government or other public policy makers. And Ofcom's role there is, is to support them, provide technical and regulatory advice and data to ensure that. For example, our USO scheme and the Scottish government scheme that. I mean, we, we want to see smooth interaction between them as, as possible. We, do, we don't have a formal role. I think it's worth just reminding the committee of that. We don't have a formal role on R100, but we're looking at ways in how these two schemes can, can uh, link up together to, to deliver those improvements for people in rural areas that, that you mentioned. You, you don't have a formal role in R100, but do you have a view that R100 should start with rural areas instead of simply allowing urban areas to have that competitive advantage all the time, that the R100 should focus heavily on that outside in approach to make sure that rural areas do not continue to have that competitive disadvantage with all the impact that has? So, so I think the, the Scottish Government in their the most recent publications on this, they, they have said that the, the focus is on, on rural areas first. So um, a lot of the urban centres in Scotland, so the main, the main city, uh, urban areas, they, they've been taken out of scope of R100 because they believe that the commercial investment and the things that Ofcom is doing and just the normal deployment from the operators, that will address the urban areas. So they have said that the, the priority and the immediate focus is on rural areas and I believe I think about £383 million of the total 600 has been allocated to um, to the Highlands and Islands region, and then another significant chunk of that money is to to, to the border of South, South Scotland. So, I think they I think they have identified that as as, as their, their priority. I know that colleagues um, will have questions specifically on R100. So, can I just focus on the, the work that you've said that you, the Ofcom are, are, are carrying out? What would you um, say is a good result then at the end of 2019? Bearing in mind we've got 66 percent of rural Scotland getting coverage of superfast broadband at the moment, what is a good result at the end of 2019 based on that work that the UC Ofcom are doing? So I, I guess it depends what, um, what speed we're looking at. So for, for the USO criteria of 10 megabits per second and, and one down, four, it's only 4% of Scotland. That, that's still too much, but there's 4% of Scotland that, um, that don't meet that criteria yet. So hopefully Universal Service would would address those issues. I do take the point that a number of the premises uh, in Scotland might exceed the USO c cost threshold, which is £3,400 for, for the network to, to come be deployed to your premise. So what we have, we've taken that feedback on board and what we're proposing is um, uh, it's called demand aggregation. So if one person in a community calls up and says, I want to exercise my right to request the USO, there's an automatic presumption that 70% of the premises in that area would also want to take it up. So the idea behind that is it speeds up the deployment. So we'd be in a better position by the end of 2019. Well, 
when the USO takes effect, uh, and there is a, a yeah, and so we would expect operators to be the majority of cases and the rollout of USO to be within 12 months. I think it's just worth pointing out the timing and to your question about what can we expect by the end of 2019. I think the progress we've seen in the last uh, three to four months that we've just updated you on, that's likely to continue between now and the end of uh, 2019. So what, are gonna, what, what can move the dial on that are the programs that we just mentioned. So the USO from our side that we're in charge of implementing, the R100 from the Scottish Government, the outside in fibre programme from the UK Government. All of those schemes are just ramping up. And to be very specific, on the USO, uh, by the end of this year, uh, it's only going to be kicking off. And then people can start ordering it, we hope, by the end of this year, beginning of next year. And then there's a 12-month uh, timeline for people to actually be delivered. So those are the things from that next year, those programs coming in that can really move the dial. Be beyond that, this year is going to be a steady progression, but not without those programs kicking in. But, but the figures you gave at the start were, were for super fast broadband, so we're talking about speeds of 30, and you said it was it was 92% across um, the whole of Scotland, and, and the figures in your report show 66% in rural Scotland, so that's speeds of 30. So what, come the end of 2019, do you expect that coverage to be in rural Scotland at 66%? At the end of 2018, what will it be at the end of 2019? As I said, the same kind of uh, incremental progression as, as we've seen over the last three months, because there's nothing this year which is going to move the dial more than that current progression. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to put a number on you know, what, what increase you'll see from 66%. There is an additional point that's worth making, which is there's still legacy investment from some of the existing schemes happening too. So Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband and the BDUK scheme uh, and the gain share that came from that is still being invested back in it. So that will contribute to the small increments that Mansour mentions. But it isn't until 2019, 2020 when you're going to see USO and R100 beginning to come in that you might see that dial being shifted faster. And the, and the, the other the final point which you mentioned earlier is that, that Area 3 in terms of geographic economics of network rollout you know, covers most of Scotland. Um, so what we're consulting on is effectively a new investment model to encourage open reach to invest in those areas in a way which is very difficult today and where it's unlikely to have other investments. So the areas that are not going to be covered by the other government or Scottish government schemes uh, will be addressed through that as well. And we're also consulting on allowing access to dark fibre to allow more greater competition on a single... If there's only going to be one single infrastructure, we need to allow access to as many players as possible. All of those are, again, going to shift the dial considerably. But again, that scheme is only going to be implemented from the next round from 2021. Just having a quick look at the Connected Nations Scotland report. So there was 87% super fast coverage in December 2017. And that's progressed to, to 92 over the course of the year. So I, I, I'd imagine you could see similar, similar incremental improvements. And before that, it was, it was hovering around 75%. So just to give you a sense of uh, how it moves on each year. Colin, just, just before we move on, Jonathan, I, I, I'm not sure I picked it up, but it will probably come up just about delivery of R100. So I'm, I'm going to bring Maureen in because you, I think you want to ask about that. And, and, and if you want to come back on something, John, uh, Colin, I'll, I'll bring to you more. OK, so, I mean, does Ofcom have a, a target for full fibre coverage uh, in Scotland by the end of, of, of 2019? And, you know, how quickly, you say there's all this rollout going on, how quickly <laughs> do you see um, the, the coverage really increasing, stepping up a pace um, over, the, over the coming years? And to, a, to an extent that you see Scotland, you know, matching the rest of the UK, because we've still got this lag between Scotland and the rest of the UK. So, so can I just check, was, was that in particular around full fibre? Yeah. Full fibre, so fat fibre to the premise. So, so Ofcom doesn't have a, a, a target for, for full fibre. Uh, the UK government has, in its, its future telecoms infrastructure review, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's 15 million. 15 million lines by 2025. Sorry, 15, I think the government target in the FTIR is 15 million by 2025, and then pretty much all of the country by 2032, I think. So that's full fibre, which is defined as you know 300 meg and above, which is beyond the super fast and everything else we discussed. Um, and so at the moment, Scotland is 4% is full fibre coverage. Um, in the rest of the UK, I believe it's, um, it's not much, not much, it's about 6%. Mm. Um, 
So we don't have a target for full fibre. Obviously, we want to, to see that move forward as much as possible. Um, and just to go back to the document we published last week, which was entitled, um, well, it's, it's all about encouraging full fibre investment. And so obviously, as we've touched on many times already, the commercial case isn't always there for operators in, in rural areas. So again, just to go back to the sort of safeguards that we're putting in there, it's allowing open reach to, well, to ensure that open reach has the, still incentivised to invest in full fibre. We're going to be allowing it to spread the cost of that deployment amongst its customer base. So we've got a real focus on the future of full fibre because obviously the UK does lag behind some other European countries in that respect. And so the proposals we put out last week are all about des all designed to ensure that if it's not open reach, that there's other um, other providers investing in full fibre. You got you got a range of possibilities from the USO, which is the minimum to the full fiber, which is the maximum. And then you have in between the super fast and the, you know, everything else. So from the schemes that we mentioned, USO is not going to deliver full fiber. Uh, the R100 is aiming for 30 meg, which is not full fiber. The government scheme that is looking at the full fiber is the outside in uh, UK government scheme, which is just about kicking off now, where it was, they were pushing from UK broadband, broadband UK, they were pushing on the 30 meg. And I think what they've decided is that the final five or 6% Rather than keep pushing on the 30 meg, they should make a focus on full fibre from the outside in. And I think that's a really interesting approach, a very difficult approach. So that might actually start delivering some uh, full fibre from the rural areas in. Uh, it's quite ambitious, but that will add to it. And then, as, as Johnny pointed out, from our side, we're focusing on that area three, looking at the economics of full fibre investment in the rural areas to make sure the rural areas are not left behind as fibre goes to the rest of the country. But do you not see your role as kind of being the, the pusher, the incentivizer to get that's private companies? Because they're not going to do it unless there's some sort of that's, that's exactly push. What, that's exactly what we've set out in this document. So in the areas where we expect to see some competition, we're allowing pricing flexibility to, so operators can compete with each other in the areas where there will be competitions or there, there's an expectation there will be people building and competing full fibre networks. But obviously, as Mansur said, that, that final third of, of, of the UK, really, where there isn't that commercial case for doing it, that, that's exactly what we've set out to drive that investment to ensure that we don't have a situation where we have a, a digital divide that's opened up over, or, over super fast over the years. This is all about now the forward-looking uh, agenda for this, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're trying to drive that investment. Wherever we think there's anybody who's likely to build their own fibre, uh, we want to encourage that and support it, reduce the cost, reduce the bureaucracy, uh, remove the blockers. And if by doing that they need access to ducts and poles that are currently you know, owned by BT, that's a, a good way of doing that. So that's where our focus in the areas where we think people, are, people can invest and are ready to invest. We're working on the whole system where OpenReach has, a, has an incentive to invest themselves, but opening up the assets so it's easier for other people to build new physical infrastructure. Then there's the area three where we think that even with all, all of that, uh, we don't see any appetite for anybody to actually invest because the, the costs are quite challenging and the, ge the geographical limitations are very challenging. In those areas, we're making sure that we can come to a model where at least open reach can continue to invest in fiber there and also then opening up the open reach infrastructure to as many players as possible who might use, the, use their fiber or uh, put retail offerings on their wholesale offers. And just, just before we move off on this, I, 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 I know there are other providers apart from BT that have fibre connections across Scotland. Probably the, the best one are power lines, and, and SAC have a fibre uh, connector across all of the uh, things. I've asked them why they don't utilise that, and they say because they can't get a licence to utilise it. Um, it. Would you consider licensing people like uh, SAC who have got fibre broadband uh, and have they approached you because they've told me that they can't get a licence? I think you're talking about code powers um, here in terms of licence. Uh, so in this case what's really interesting is you know we, we changed the electronic communications code to encourage more players in this field and since we did that last year uh, we've seen a huge rush of applications for code powers um, and Nearly every week, we're publishing consultations on attributing code powers. Now, I'm not I'm not uh, up to speed on whether SSE have asked for that, 
but we can check for you if you want. Well, I think it's certainly interesting in rural areas. Often we do have uh, um, pylon lines with broadband connectors all the way along the top of it, and it might make those remote houses more easy to connect. I can think of huge amounts across the highlands, but they're telling me that they just meet nothing but problems. Perhaps you could clarify that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure from whom they meet problems, um, but it is worth saying that there is a... Um, there is a scheme called the Access to Infrastructure Regulations, which explicitly allows telecoms or communications providers to be able to use other infrastructure, particularly gas and electricity. Mm -hmm. So we've um, had a conversation, we actually had a conversation with the Connectivity Minister and Ofgem a few weeks ago about this, um, and we're going to be doing, uh, I think a date still to, to be confirmed, uh, a roundtable with providers, with Ofgem, with ourselves and with the Minister to have a conversation about access to infrastructure. The, the important well, there's two important things to say about it. One is it wasn't a, a system designed for sort of large-scale infrastructure or network build. Um, and secondly, Ofcom has a formal function um, for resolving any disputes between commercial operators uh, in terms of access to infrastructure. So if they are not able to agree commercial terms, then they can come to Ofcom and say, we can't do that, we need you to arbitrate and do that for us. So it is, it is a space we're active in, uh, and we would expect um, the gas and electricity providers to be coming to the session that we're doing with the Scottish Government in the next few weeks. Yeah, well, I think probably, I mean, and I understand the point, and I think the very point that has been raised at this committee might prompt one or two of those people with fibre optic cables to actually start thinking about how to use them. And, and we are quite pushed for time. There are a lot of questions. So I'm going to part that one there and, and thank you for that and, and maybe take it up with you later. Jamie, uh, the next question is yours. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I uh, revert back to uh, broadband rollout in Scotland? Uh, specifically looking at the Reaching 100 uh, programme. Uh, can I ask Ofcom, what is your understanding of how many premises at the moment have access to superfast broadband, commercial or residential, as defined by the 30 meg uh, target? So, so in the Connecting Nations should Sorry, how, how many premises? Either as a number or percentage? As 92% of premises. How many, sorry? 92%. 92, 92. Yeah. okay. And do you have any understanding as to whether the Reaching 100 project will be reached in terms of dates? Because there seems to be a little bit of confusion as to the definition of what by 2021 means. That could easily be... the end of December 2020, it could be the end of 2021, or indeed, as one media report put it, it could be financial year 21, which means March 2022. What is your understanding of when that target may be reached? So, so obviously, as, as I said, we, we don't have any formal role in that, so we are not party to the, the procurement discussions, um, as we shouldn't be. Um, so we have to work on the basis of... of, of what, what we understand it to be, we understand that the Connectivity Minister said contracts would be awarded in 2019. They still have um, the target of 2021, but our, our focus has been on aligning the USO and the R100 programmes. And our focus then is the start of 2020, when the USO kicks in. So provided that we have the mechanisms in place then to um, allow these two schemes to interact smoothly, sharing data is going to be really important. The R100 contractors or contractor, whoever, whoever they may be, and the USO provider, there will have to be an exchange of information between the two to ensure that there's, um, a, that there's no overlap in terms of the rollout and that people are um, within the, the correct timescales. But as to, to the actual date, that, that wouldn't impact or affect our um, engagement with them on, on the USO because, as I said, the USO takes effect from the start of 2020. Okay, so my, my reading of your answer is therefore your engagement or your focus is on responsibility on the USO, not on R100. Therefore, the information that you get around one, R100 is a courtesy given to you by the Scottish Government and its directorate as opposed to having any formal role in the rollout of that programme. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so I've been quite part, put it in those terms so we have discussions with them um, to get updates on, on progress given that it's in procurement phase as you'd expect obviously it's limited um, what can be said publicly about that and and with us as well so as i said our focus has been on ensuring that the consumers who 
exceed the USO cost threshold and um, might not be immediately picked up through the first phase of R100 to ensure that they aren't left out. So there's scope there for us to look at how we can <coughs> line up the two, the two schemes, and that we isn't do. dependent on the, the end time scale for completion. And we do, we do also provide technical advice on request uh, to, to the Scottish Government and uh, to all these schemes if they ask for technical advice about, you know, um, what's the best way to configure infrastructure, etc. We were happy to provide that. Mm. Okay, I, I think that you, that's an interesting point, is this interaction between the two governmental schemes. Uh, can you just explain to me, I mean, clearly that this last 8% is going to be the hardest to reach, which, and there's a reason why it's the, the last 8% uh, from a geographic point of view, from a technical point of view. Um, so inevitably there's uh, some challenges uh, there in, in ensuring that 100% of all premises are, are covered. But can you explain to me, and this is something I think we've touched on previously but never quite got to the bottom of, is the interaction between the, the universal service obligation that it will exist for 10 meg in 100% of Scotland and a R100 scheme for 30 meg also in 100% of Scotland. And if there are uh, if there is a separate contract or a single provider who is responsible for both or two providers working alongside, what that interaction will be, are we, is public money being spent twice or are, are, are the two schemes complementing each other? And I, I'm never quite sure we got to the bottom of that. Yeah, so it's, it's a very good question. <laughs> the, so it's worth, worth saying that the universal service obligation or your right to request that won't apply to you if you are due to receive um, deployment or if, if there's another publicly funded scheme that has given a firm commitment that it will be coming to your premise within 12 months. So that is designed to address the point there about um, duplication of effort and sort of um, public fund. It's, it's worth saying, obviously, that the USO isn't publicly funded. This is funded through industry. So there isn't, as such, UK taxpayers' money going into this in the same way that there is with the R100 programme. So I'm sure Jamie's going to ask you this, but the question therefore is, if R100 is to be rolled out um, and we don't have a date for when it's going to be rolled out, and at the end of this year we could ask, if we don't have broadband, that we want the universal service obligation of, of the 10 megabits, that, that it could be said, well, you're getting R100 by 2021, Therefore, we don't need to supply it for you. Is no, that what you're saying, or if I'm no, no, no. So, uh, that? as I said, it has to be a firm commitment. So, the the R100 contractor or contractors would have to share with the USO provider, and that this is why I mentioned earlier about the data sharing being so important. Okay. They'd have to show we have a clear rollout plan. We are coming to this premise within 12 months. Therefore, your USO doesn't apply. And what happens to? I mean. The poor consumer, sorry, Jamie, I'm, I'm standing on your question, but what happens to the poor consumer at the end when, when that, that neither of the dates are reached and he doesn't get it on time or she doesn't get it on time? The R100 or, yeah. or USO? Well, if it's told you're getting yeah. R100 and R100 isn't delivered on the date that it's supposed to be, so they've missed out on the USO, what, what, what so, happens to So they're to in the a consumer? better position than, than they would have been because at least they can request the, the USO. And it's, it's worth saying that because of the technology, you're not going to get just a, sta a bang on 10 megabits per second. In many cases, it could be more than that. You could end up actually with a super fast connection, therefore taking you out of the scope of, of, of R100. But if, if R100 contractors hadn't, um, if they weren't coming to your premise by that day anyway, you still, would, you still wouldn't have the option of being able to request USO. So this is at least something that people can look to in, in the interim while they're waiting for, for the R100. So the first thing is, as we said, upfront clear plans to be shared, and I think that's fully understood by the R100 uh, people and, and by the USO people. Ideally, we'd like this to be into a single provisioning tool, software, that the USO provider can see directly the updates from the R100 program. Now, to your point, it's a very good point, the detail of what happens if they had a strong plan to deliver R100 to a customer, therefore that customer was not eligible for USO. Our aim, and we need to work through the detail of this as we go into implementation, our aim would be to flag that this person was delivered was due to be delivered in R100, and our expectation would be that we would get regular updates from the R100 suppliers on where they are, and if they do reach a blocker at any stage, 
we could have the option to reactivate the USO at that stage and accelerate where possible. That would be our ambition to do that, but we need to work through all the detail at the moment. Okay, Jamie, I apologise for standing no, on your so you, question. You, you, you've raised, raised a very interesting point, and, and I, I won't duplicate that, but I will follow on from it. <clears throat> from a consumer's point of view, clearly 30 meg is better than 10. There's no dispute about that. But if you're currently getting speeds of 1 or 2, then 10 is better than nothing. So the, the, the problem I have, though, is that if, if you are premised now, a business or a, a consumer, a residential consumer, and the end of 2021 or, or perhaps beginning of 2022 seems far away, uh, you won't know the date uh, currently of when R100 is coming to you because the contracts have not been awarded yet. So in that instance, could they uh, request the 10 meg USO in the interim? And how achievable would that be, given that if one single household in the middle of nowhere says, I have no idea when R100 is coming to me, it could be two and a half years away, but I want a better service now. Under USO, who is obliged to provide that service and will it be achievable? achievable? So, so it wouldn't be the, the consumer wouldn't we, there wouldn't be an expectation that the consumer would have sight of the deployment plans. This is what Matt Mansour is going to Mansour's point there. It's for the USO provider and the R100 contractors to share that information. So, obviously, do do, do accept the point here that there's a risk of customer confusion, but it wouldn't be on the consumer to go and find out when R100 is is coming to their premise. That will take placed behind the scenes, the R100 contractor and the USO. No, provider. I appreciate that, but you haven't answered my question. Sorry, my question was, if they have no idea when R100 is coming to them, either via proactive or reactive mm -hmm. measure, uh, but they would like better broadband now, can they utilise USO, and is that deliverable to a single house in the middle of nowhere, given that there's, so, there may be R100 coming down the line? So, short answer is yes, they can utilise the USO. Um, the point around them being um, sort of in, in the middle of nowhere is, is the the question or the point there around the sort of cost threshold for them and how how would the operator actually come come out to them so there's there's as i said there's the demand aggregation point so if it did speed up the deployment of the uso and reduce the cost of it there's an assumption as i said that there'd be 70 percent of premises in that area or cluster of premises however it's yet to be determined how that's defined um they would be able to request the USO. So the, the whole point there is it's a legal right to request that. There is some criteria there that might affect um, uh, the, the sort of cost and the speed of it coming to you, but it is a legal right to be able to request that. And it's worth making a point, this isn't just a, 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 a sort of R100 uh, point as well. It's, it's worded in the um, Broadband Universal Service Order that it's publicly funded. So the same applies to the schemes in Wales and in Northern Ireland as well. And it's designed to address that point that you made about sort of public funds and uh, duplication. Just, just, just to clarify, so, yeah, so the timing, as we said, we expect um, customers to be able to order a USO from uh, at the latest by the beginning of next year. So or the end of this year, so roughly that's the time scale. So when they can start actually ordering, and then they've got a 12 month time scale. So we will use the best visibility we have to make sure the USO provider can take into account of an R100 delivery. Now, if in the, in, in, at some time uh, a customer has ordered USO, and again, this is a 10 megabit connection at a reasonable price, so there will be some price restrictions there. Um, if any other service becomes available after that date, or if, if R100 lands after that date, there will be a choice from the customer to upgrade to a 30 meg connection with a different contract. So the, the flexibility will be there. To your other point, as, as Johnny's pointed out, there will, there will be obviously a long tail of uh, individual residences where the cost will be prohibitive. And the first approach is to see, can we actually aggregate the cost to some extent and solve it on a group level? And that's the, that's the first port of call. Beyond that, technically, we will be working with the USO provider to see, in the case where you can't even do that, the, the small minority of really extreme cases, what are the other technical solutions that are available that could be used as a, you know, as a, as a backup, and uh, in which case can they be applied? So our aim is to at least have a solution for everybody wherever possible. I think the message is uh, something the committee has been asking for a long time, is the importance of getting the exact dates for, for rollout in, in specific areas. I think it's just about every committee meeting we've had uh, when it comes to broadband has been rolled out. Peter, I'm going to come to you now. Yeah, well, just following up on that, I mean, Jamie mentioned contracts, but I mean, we're, we were told that the Scottish Government was aiming to announce that contracts had been signed by early 2019. We are 
unaware of any how far along that process has gone. Do you feel that R100 is already slipping behind schedule, or, or, or are we eminently going to hear that the uh, contracts are going to be signed very shortly, or do you know? Well, we, we don't. We don't. We're not privy to that information. We're, we have to focus, as Jonathan said, on our statutory responsibilities for implementation of the UK Universal Service Obligation, and then on any interaction. And that's where our. our our conversation is focused. So we're not privy to a conversation ongoing sort of procurement dialogue that the Scottish Government's having with uh, uh, the different potential providers. Um, it, it's important, you know, it's, it's important to us to be able to understand uh, when it's going to happen exactly so we can get into this detailed conversation about the sharing of data. Mm. Um, but we're, we're no more privy to that information than, than here or, or anywhere else. Okay, um, following on from that, uh, OpenReach, I believe, has got a, something called a copper rearrangement programme to, uh, to allow upgrades to exchange-only cables, mainly in, in rural areas. Uh, do you know if that programme is on time and on schedule and will be completed in time to allow the, the further rollout? Well, we, we know that we have a, an OpenReach monitoring unit which is looking into detail at all of the programmes. And as part of the commitments from last year that have been implemented. And we had an interim report in November of last year, and we're going to have the full annual report later this year. So they will be reporting on all the relevant programs where OpenReach is and how they're performing. So that update, I think it's in the summer, the first annual report. So we take our role in that very seriously. Um, with the new commitments, we have a clear role in that monitoring unit to make sure they are delivering on their promises. So we will mm -hmm. look at that. I mean, specifically, there are there has been a long going, a long program of upgrading all the exchanges to the next gener the new generation, which allows full fibre. So that is proceeding. But I think in the in the rural areas in particular, it's uh, due to the challenges we mentioned earlier. It needs a bit of a a boost to to speed up. And I mean, there's no doubt about it. In the, in the rural areas, the, the big problem often is you can be connected to a, a green cabinet, but yeah. you're too far down the line. You've got too much copper between you and that cabinet to, to be any use, and you end up with still, you know, one or two or three megs is, is, is the maximum you can achieve. So, in some respects, you, they, they tell you you're connected to a cabinet, but it's no damned use because it, you're too far down that copper line. And in a nutshell, you you know. You're, that is exactly it. You can make technology as complicated as we want it to be, but the bottom line is the longer the distance on your copper line to the nearest exchange or cabinet, mm. and not only that, but the variability of that distance uh, hugely impacts the quality of service people get. So while you might have a fibre going to the exchange, or you might have the fibre going from the exchange to the cabinet, um, if you have a huge variability of, of the distance to that cabinet, you can't guarantee any quality of service. So that's the biggest challenge. That is, that is the fundamental challenge in Scotland, where there's a huge variability of distances from individual houses to the nearest cabinets. So, bring in Stuart and come back to you for the next question. Sorry, Stuart. I, I just wanted to be very specific because Aberdeenshire and I think Dumfries and Galloway in particular uh, are areas where there's a much higher proportion of exchange only lines than is the case elsewhere, and therefore you're automatically excluded even if your copper is short enough uh, from the prospect being connected to the current generation of rollout uh, of fibre-enabled copper. Is there a focus in Ofcom in these particular areas where the copper rearrangement programme is particularly and locally important in a way that it is less important for homes that I know in central Edinburgh that are also direct uh, exchange only? So, so, so you're quite right to point out the. I mean, Scotland in general has a higher. Um, there's more exchange-only cabinets in, in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. I think it's five percent. It was eight percent last year, but it's five percent compared to the UK average of of three percent. So, it's worth pointing out. Obviously, these, these cabinets and it's essentially it's open reach as they deploy their network mm. where they go that they will make these um, upgrades. They'll do these upgrades to the cabinets. But all the work and initiatives and schemes that we've just been speaking about today, they will have to be upgraded as part of as part of that process in order to deliver super fast speeds to people, full fibre investment. So um, those cabinets obviously are, are 
it's, it's restrictive in the speeds that people can get in rural areas for the reasons that Mansur said about the length of the line. But these cabinets should be upgraded as part of Open Reach's ongoing. Um, when? Well, in line with, I mean, that we obviously we don't have oversight of Open Reach's uh, commercial deployment plans, but that we would expect to see that as part of the R100 programme, as part of the investment in full fibre, and potentially as well through through USO. Yes. Peter. Yeah. I mean, we're focusing in on the very hard to reach the last 8%. Um, so how important will, will other technologies, for instance, fixed wireless access networks, be, be a, a, a solution to these particularly hard to reach areas? I mean, you did mention it before. Uh, is this going to be one of the more main, main issues, the main re, uh, ways that we can achieve R100? And how well, important is it? Yeah, and so first of all, just to, to kind of hook into the point about SSE, if you were talking about a license beyond fibre in terms of putting an antenna on their, their masts, then that's, you know, they could actually ask for fixed wireless and, you know, spectrum is available now and unlicensed, plus we're also consulting on shared spectrum 3.8 to 4.2. But if it's specifically the R100, so again, if, you know, when the, the government, when the Scottish government asks us our opinion on what are the technologies, we're clear that, you know, in rural areas such as that, if you have that situation with the variability of the lines, um, it would be foolish not to look at all the op options to make sure you can reach all the customers. Mm. So it should be in the mix. Now, I can't tell you, you need to ask the R100 team whether they're actually actively promoting that. But in our technical advice, we've said it should be in the mix. As a whole, across all of uh, uh, the UK and Scotland in particular, uh, we have made it clear that you, for USO, fixed wireless has a huge impact. It has a huge impact in two ways, really. Uh, one is that the existing fixed wireless services that are being rolled out across the rural areas, where those copper lines are way too long to get a decent service, sometimes the radio waves are a better, better shout if they can have that line of sight. Mm. And so there are several the mobile operators who are rolling this out in the rural areas. What they're doing is they're providing an equivalent of the 10 meg service uh, to customers in those areas. So what we did on that is we did quite a lot of analysis. What we wanted to do was make sure that if an operator is providing a fixed wireless service, is the quality of that service, the reliability, the capacity of that service mm. similar to a 10 meg line? Mm. So we did a full analysis on that using probes and using real customers. And we're confident that it is for the 10 megabit service. We wouldn't say it's equivalent necessarily to full fiber. So we've accepted that if people are, we're encouraging operators to roll out that fixed wireless service, especially for the 10 megabit, the people who have nothing. And then beyond that, if, uh, if one of the USO providers cannot get uh, a fixed solution to the people who are in scope for the USO, but they can do it uh, through fixed wireless, then that's something that we're also going to have a good look at and, and, and offer that as one of the solutions. Because the reality is, this is so hard to solve for everybody that you need to have as many tools in your toolbox as, as you can, and fixed wireless is one of them. So fixed, so, so, just, just to, so fixed wire, so fixed wire could, could well deliver 30 megs. Is that, is that you, I mean, you said it would be a solution for, to get at least 10, but could it, could it deliver 30? That's a, that's a really good question. So on the 10 megabit USO, we've done the analysis, and we're confident that you know, it's, it can be used. We would prefer it to be fixed, but it can be used. On the 30 meg, um, we've looked at that more in the analysis of 5G fixed wireless. Um, and as you know, one of the mobile operators in the UK has been quite public about their plans to offer fixed wireless over, over the existing 5G spectrum that they're rolling out. Our feeling is that if it's done the right way, they could offer an equivalent to, to super fast, 30 meg. Uh, where, we're not, where it's not there at the moment is ultra fast. I mean, full fiber is still full fiber is the only solution to get 300 meg or above, uh, together with cable, obviously. And, fixed technologies. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, and the next question is John Mason. John. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, we've had some mention of mobiles before, so I was wanted to kind of move back to that. We were provided with a table um, which shows the kind of level of coverage, different aspects of 4G and voice. And it was just to confirm, one of the figures we were given was that there's good 4G indoor coverage from at least one operator in 99% of premises and indoor voice coverage from at least one operator in 100% of premises. Can you just confirm, am I understanding these figures correctly? Would these, do these sound correct? Sorry, Mr. Mason, is this from the um, Connected Nations? I am not sure where what? the figures came from. Yes, 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 
I'm being told it is, yes. <laughs> um, so, so just to understand that, that was... So broad, broadly speaking, um, indoor coverage in Scotland is, 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 is comparable to the rest of the UK, 90%. That, that specific example there is from at least one operator, there is 100% indoor coverage. And in, indoor coverage means inside yes. a building? Yeah. Any yeah. building? Yeah. From at least one operator, is that? Yes. I mean, on Saturday I was in a restaurant which happened to be underneath an old church in my that, constituency, that's, that's and I don't think there was any <laughs> coverage. From at least one operator, though. So it you think there depends was. which well, operator you're on. Of course, I can check that. Maybe I can clarify a little bit. And yes. this, is, this is a tricky subject because it's very difficult to to kind of have clarity, and we're working on making our connect nations even more clear. So first of all, in terms of indoor coverage, there is a clear le leader in, in our statistics, and that's because there was a coverage obligation on 4G for indoor coverage for one operator. Um, in terms of voice, so when we talk about 4G coverage, we're talking about voice plus a minimum of two megabits uh, data. Whereas when you talk about the voice statistics, that can include 3G as well. So that's why the numbers are slightly different. Uh, the, but to your point about there are places where you don't get indoor coverage, that is true. Uh, and every calculation is an approximation. As you know, a church is not the same as a bungalow. Right. And so wh whatever, whatever we, stone houses are different. And the more, the more double and triple glazing you put in, yes. unfortunately, your indoor coverage is going to go down. That's the reality, because when you stop heat going out, you stop radio signals coming in. So the reality is this is an approximation. So we use... When we, we report, we have to take something that is communicable, so we take an assumption of the loss of signal going into an average household. What that means is if you're in the basement or if you're in a stone church, etc., you may not always have that coverage, but otherwise we would have a 1,000-page report for all the buildings in the, in the country. So that, okay. unfortunately, that's where we're trying okay, our best well, to be Sorry, can I, can I just helps. say, I think it's very dangerous using 100% as, as a figure for, for indoor voice coverage from at least one actually. operator. I mean, I, there's plenty of places I would suggest everyone's got in their constituency where you get no coverage in, in houses. So 100% is just going to provoke people, perhaps. Uh, Stuart, you want to come in and then I'll come back to well, John. Well, I just want to say I don't have outdoor coverage, uh, but also... Just to illustrate how severe this is, they tried to fit a smart meter to us, and our meter's on the outside wall of the house, and it relies on connecting to a mobile network. Where they were told there was no signal. They spent two-thirds of a day, they installed it, they waited an hour, no coverage. They then spent another two hours taking it away again. So, so the 100 percent I, I really counsel you not to use 100% number, even if I am the only example in Scotland that beats it. And I was about to say, and I know I won't be. <laughs> Point on you, that. you have. I think we'd quite like to come back to you because I, I don't think that was a figure from Connected Nations, but we're, we're, happy, to, we're happy to clarify it. Spence. OK. Um, right, we've varied a, a little bit there between, I was kind of concentrating on indoor to start with, but I think that's expanded, but that was the next point, is the kind of geographic coverage. And, um, I mean, we've had various figures mentioned. I think, again, the figure I've been given is that in Scotland, good 4G geographic coverage from all operators would be 38%, uh, but good 4G geographic coverage from at least one operator would be 78%. Is there a target for that? Maybe that's been mentioned already, but uh, is there a target for where that should be going? So the, so the latest um, geographic coverage is, is now 41. 41, so right. we've seen that improvement. Um, the Connected Nations report, I mean, this, this is obviously Mansur's area, but the um, Connected Nations report is, isn't designed to set out policy objectives and targets. It's more about presenting the state of communications across the UK, so and there's a retrospective look there as well. The, the targets that have been mentioned already for Scotland, which was the 74% um, coverage target for geographic coverage, that's linked to the auction of the 700 megahertz band, which is, is particularly good for, for, for rural coverage. Um, so there's a coverage obligation target, which is, is separate to what we are reporting on in, in Connected Nations. And, and that kind of land target, is that just any land? Because, I mean, for a lot of motorists and things, it's, it's the roads that matter, either the motorways or the A roads, probably. Um, 
is there any way of differentiating them and, and sp specifically measuring how they're doing? Yeah, so just to clarify, just we, I mean, the government has a target of 95% geographical uh, on the long term. So we broadly support that, that target as kind of an overall ambition. And as Johnny said, the coverage obligation, obligations are a step towards that. Um, to your point about roads, we think that roads are obviously an area of importance and we are planning to increase our focus on that. We're taking views from around the country. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is give a bit more clarity on the coverage. And we have a few sentences in Connected Nations at the moment. We think we need to give a bit more clarity on the quality and uh, spread and choice on road coverage and rail coverage across the UK. And we hope to do that uh, sometime during this year. So it might be in the updates. It's likely to be at the final annual report in December. But in the meantime, we might be able to give a bit more clarity during some of the quarterly updates as well. OK, thank you. And I think, um, can I just ask you too about 5G and where we're going with that? Because um, I think there's been some commitment to publish findings of a minimum level of service for 5G. Um, can you give us any comment on that? I'm not sure about the commitment on minimum level of service. What's very clear, and it's actually good news, uh, is that we'll have the first launches, commercial launches of 5G uh, this year. So from our perspective, we'd like to get ready to make sure that we can start reporting on the quality and coverage of 5G in at least uh, the same way, you know, if not better, as we do today with existing technologies. So as part of that, we may be looking at what's relevant and useful to consumers around the UK in terms of you know, what it means for them whether that's a minimum level of service, whether it's a speed, whether it's a coverage issue, or, or else that'll be part of the mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole question of rural and urban has already been mentioned. I mean, I think there's a project called 5G Rural First. Uh, can you say anything on that? It's a wonderful project, and uh, I absolutely love it. <laughs> it's a wonderful, and it was actually, when I was, you know, many years ago in my previous roles, I used to come up to Inverness, and we kicked off what we call the Innovation, Scottish Innovation Partnership. We didn't really know where it was going, but we just thought we had to do something to get people to focus more on the rural areas. That's Most of the people there now have morphed into this DCMS-funded project rule first. I was at their event last uh, Thursday um, in Glasgow, and it, it's wonderful what they're doing now. What they're doing is focused on the really difficult area. Many of the things we've discussed about, they're trying to crack those. It's not really 5G yet, because the 5G terminals weren't really available until this year. The good news is that project has been extended by the government, so it's going to run into next year, and we'll have then the real 5G kit coming in. And the Orkneys is a, is a key focus for that, as, as you know, but also other areas around Scotland. So many of the innovations that I mentioned uh, previously to the question from, from Gail Ross, um, I've asked DCMS to include them in the future extensions of that project or more specific rural projects. What I'd like to draw the attention to is what that project does is absolutely the right thing for this country because, number one, it gets everybody who's involved in that together and look at the real problems in a real pragmatic way of, of how to solve them. Number two, it's turning the perceived weaknesses into strengths. So everything we've said about why it's so difficult in Scotland, they've actually put their finger on those and say, how can we get, a, get, a, get, get a, across those and, and, and break down those barriers? I was with the team in uh, Barcelona, the Mobile World Congress, where 107,000 people came, and they were presenting there, and it got attention from every country you know, that passed by the stand. It, was a, it got an amazing amount of focus, because nobody's, nobody else in the world is really trying to solve the, the, the rural problem with 5G. And the way they're doing it is, is to look at what are the new technologies in 5G that could help the rural coverage problem. And I think it's... It's, it's just exciting to hear from many governments and uh, regulators that this is one of the most innovative 5G projects. And again, I would say, if you know the difficulties that we face in Scotland, how can you turn them into strengths? It's by showcasing that type of uh, innovation here and the talent here in Scotland and opening it up to the world. So I think it's a fantastic project and you should all go to the Orkneys. My, my colleague Philip was there yesterday and uh, you know it's the most amazing project, very, very challenging, and they haven't solved all the problems, but it's definitely worth a visit. Okay, thanks so much.
Jamie, you had a brief question, <coughs> which will be the last one. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I, something we haven't really touched on, we talked about access to services, but what work is Ofcom doing to promote uh, some of the voucher schemes that are available? I, I think we hear very little about them. Unfortunately, um, there are some good schemes around, such as the Gigabit Voucher Scheme, which offers up to £2,500 to businesses, and, of course, the uh, extension of the Better Broadband Subsidy Scheme, which offers £350 to those living in rural areas to connect at home. Uh, I think awareness amongst consumers in Scotland is very low uh, of these voucher schemes. Uh, what work has been done to improve that? Um, so we don't, we don't have a formal function in the promotion of those schemes. Um, but I think, I think you're right. It's definitely the, one of the things that we've wrestled with over the last couple of years is uh, the fact that there's an availability of services or schemes that, and people haven't been taking them up, uh, which is something that we stress in the Connected Nations report as well. And I mean, there's additional schemes like the local full fibre network one that the UK, where the UK government's providing money to uh, local authorities uh, for improving services in, in public buildings as well. Um, I think we need to do more, frankly. I think we need to work with uh, the governments, uh, plural, and probably with local government uh, and potentially other public service bodies to do more promotion of it. It's, it's uh, a strand of work that we're having to look at with the implementation of universal service obligation is, is consumer advice and information, because as you've pointed out, Mr Green, it's quite confusing, this space. Um, so one of the things that we'll be doing is trying to set this out in a simple way so people understand what's available to them. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions. So thank you, Glenn, Jonathan and Ransford. So, uh, very interesting, as always, to, to hear um, the work that's going on. So thank you for, for the evidence this morning. And I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting. Could I ask committee members to be back in here by 10 to 12, please? Thanks, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back uh, and to the Royal Economy and Connectivity meeting. I'd like to move on to agenda item three, uh, which is European Union Withdrawal Act. We have received consent notifications in relation to two UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. They cover common agricultural policy and food and drink policy. These instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Does anyone wish to make any comments on the instruments? Okay, so the question therefore is, does, does the committee agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for consent for the UK SIs referred to in the notification to be given? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the committee will now move into private session. Thank you.